we'll start the session uh, with the recitation of Holy Quran. So may I please call uh, Mr. Azmatullah Qureshi for the recitation of Holy Quran. A'uzu billahi min ash-shaytanir rajeem. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Ya ayyuhal insan, ma gharraka bi rabbikal kareem, alladhi khalaqaka fasawwaka fa'adalak, fa'adalaka fi ayy suratim ma shaa'a rakkabak, kalla bal tukadzibuna biddeen. وَإِنَّا عَلَيْكُمْ لَحَافِظِينَ كِرَامًا كَاتِبِينَ يَعْلَمُونَ مَا تَفْعَلُونَ إِنَّ الْأَمْرَارَ لَفِي نَعِيمٍ وَإِنَّ الْفُجَّارَ لَفِي جَحِيمٍ يَسْلَوْنَهَا يَوْمَ الدِّينِ وَمَا هُمْ عَنْهَا بِغَائِبِينَ وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا يَوْمُ الدِّينِ ثُمَّ مَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا يَوْمُ الدِّينِ يَوْمَ لَا تَمْلِكُ نَفْسٌ لِنَفْسٍ شَيَّا وَالْأَمْرُ يَوْمَيْذِ لِلَّهِ صدق اللہ العظیم جزاک اللہ There is an announcement for you You have feedback forms in your folders Please fill those feedback forms and hand them over to the main counter when you leave the hall So we will start the session I will call upon the stage Dr. Fawad Kaiser uh, before I call him to the stage, uh, let me introduce him. Dr. Fawad Kaiser is an experienced consultant of forensic psychiatry. He was trained in UK. He is director quality, quality enhancement cell at Shifa Tamir Millat University. He is academic head for the Department of Behavioral Sciences at Shifa Tamir Millat University. He is also a visiting mental health lead for the extremism strategy with Punjab Police Training School in Sehala and he has been widely uh, and has been widely published in the area of terrorism and violence risk as well as the mental illness intervention of offenders within prisons and secure units so uh, may i please call dr fawad kaiser to the stage bismillah rahman rahim first of all my extreme thanks for all of you to come here and listen to me and I'm extremely thankful to Shifa Hospital, the medical director, and the CME team, because they've been very kind, and so is Shifa University. And I'm also very obliged to my colleagues who have worked all the way through this. I think one thing is for sure, okay, this is just a start. I'm sure what you can all say one good day is that you were there when we started it. What I'm going to do today is that I'll just give you an overview. First is um, basically what is forensic psychiatry. Second is um, we have to take a model. So since I worked in UK, how is it practiced in UK? I think then I probably we need to kind of reflect on do we have a problem in Pakistan and do we see cases which we probably think reflect on to us by saying we need forensic psychiatry <clears throat> as a service. It's a very long journey, and as you would go through with me, you would see that this is going to be an institute or a department which is going to require not only a hospital, but it's going to require services from courts and services from prison, and you need to have a specialization to do that. Uh, unfortunately, we are the only country at the moment which haven't actually developed those services, so it's a good start. And I think in the end, I'm just going to tell you what has the journey so far I have taken in the last few years to see if we can develop this facility in Pakistan. So I think um, 
what probably will remain important is to always have an introduction of what actually do we mean by what we're saying. The definition remains always important. And the definition is not very complicated because we are basically going to be dealing with a branch of psychiatry which is going to deal with the assessment, treatment of mentally disordered offenders. So patients who have got a psychiatric disorder and they have been involved in something which requires them to kind of violence, action, any disorder which requires to have judicial system involved into it, then we need to treat those people. And those need to be treated differently from the people who haven't got a mental disorder. So that is kind of the definition to start with. Now, where do you and how do you work with these people? You need to have three components to that. You need to have a secure hospital where you're going to treat them. And you need to have a prison system which initially caters for them. And then you need to have courts to decide on a mental health act. To understand forensic psychiatry, you have to see those three limbs are very important. So you need to have a mental health act which decides. And the judges and the courts need to know that they need to place them on that act. And then you have to decide where you're going to treat them. Now you can treat them in community, you can treat them in a low secure hospital, medium secure, high secure. So as we'll talk about it, you'll see how does that all work. And what is a forensic psychiatrist supposed to do? And he's supposed to do two things. The judges are going to rely on him to prepare a court report to tell us whether this man has got that problem or not. Basically, is he sane or insane? If he's insane, what makes you say he's insane? So all the disorders that we speak in psychiatry, mental illnesses, learning disabilities, personality disorders, they all have to be explained to the court or to the judge in very simple words. So you have to write and explain to them and saying, when this offense happened, this man was suffering from a state of mind which is different from what it would have been if he was not suffering from it. It's like a McNaughton's rule. And the judge then takes your report as someone who's a specialist in saying that. So you as a psychiatrist have to get the training to write a very good court report. And then you advise the judge by saying, where would I like to treat this man? So he'll ask you, where would you like to treat this man? Would you like to treat him in the community? Would you like to treat him in a secure hospital? Or would you like to leave him in this prison that we have got because you think he's not good enough to go? So the psychiatrist has to be very clear in his mind and he needs to have all those services with him. And then just like any other treatment, he has to consider medication and psychotherapy. And there are varied forms of psychotherapy that will go along with that. So, um, sorry, just, there we go. I'm sure I'll get used to the technology, it's okay. So the question is, we have just explained that. What is the forensic psychiatrist going to do is that he needs to have this competency. And competency to do what? Competency to do two things. And he has to actually stand and defend the mental disorder on the basis of insanity defense, whether he's sane or insane. And then he needs to be actually able to have these two explanations in his report. Is this man fit to stand trial? And if it is fit to stand trial, then what was his mental state at the time of offense? Because this is what the judge is interested in. He's not interested in the whole history. <clears throat> Just like we go through you know, present history, past history, and everything else that you have accumulated. <clears throat> so actually, um, what he's asking for you is to please explain to the authorities why do you think this man is not sane enough? And if he's not, and then you have to probably produce that report. With as I just explained what we're going to do. Now, I just picked up this slide because something like a few years ago, I just thought, let me just have a little cross section survey among all of us to see, do they actually people know what forensic psychiatry is and how does that work? And as you could see that after the slide is very poor, but I've tried to highlight it, the most of the psychiatrists failed to agree on a mutual definition and tending to include forensic issues when attempting to define the forensic patient. And furthermore, a significant minority believe that forensic patients can benefit from treatment. <clears throat> so what I'm just trying to say, the concept among the doctors was not even clear. I mean, they knew there are some forensic issues, but they were not exactly clear. And that kind of a thing just allowed me to understand that 
although we teach forensic psychiatry, it's kind of a maybe super subspeciality. I don't think so the doctors, even when they're practicing, had a clear idea of what is a forensic psychiatrist and what is a forensic medicine, what is forensic pathology. Even now when so many cases happened with Zeneb murder case and still I heard NAB has opened up a forensic lab in Pindi now. And people sort of are confused with the two concepts of thinking what is actually there. And so, how does this services work? And the services work because it's like a multidisciplinary teamwork. So what you do is that you have psychiatrist and psychiatrist, forensic psychiatrist who can have speciality not only dealing with mental disorders like mental illnesses, schizophrenia, depression. There are units where people would have forensic psychiatry working with just women speciality, women related disorders. Then learning disability, personality disorder. So <clears throat> when I had completed all these trainings and then started working around there, I used to work in the departments in a secure hospital. It was just meant for women. So it's women services, learning disability services, all linked to forensic psychiatry. So you need to have a team. Then the team involves few other people too. You need to have a psychologist, again, trained in forensics. You need to have nurses trained in. Then you have occupational therapists, then you have physiotherapists, then you have nutritionists. And then you have your staff that works along with it who are all trained into this. And the training is obviously done in different stages. But some of the trainings are very mutual because they all need to know about risk assessment. So the spinal cord of forensic psychiatry is risk assessment. And that's probably what they teach us from different ways. Risk assessments are the tools. You have to, and I'm just gonna show you some of them. So the teamwork is very important. Then this team does not only finish here, you have to ask the question, what happens when they go into the community? So in the community over there, we have services like called MAPA, which is multi-agency public protection thing. So that's where police gets involved. That's where all the social workers gets involved and they all work with you when you send them into the community. And so on the upper side, in prison, they have liaison officers, prison officers, who are trained in this. So if you have to go and work with the prison, they will have the people and the team who would know what is to mean by forensics. And then in the courts, judges then assign people who probably have got expertise in dealing with when they go on a probation. Judge can decide on that day and saying, I don't think so this man is good enough to go to the prison. We can understand that he has got petty thefts. He could be a kleptomanic, he could be someone who's a voyeurist, he could be an exhibitionist, I mean, mistakes that people do, sexual disorders. And the judge decides he has to go into the community, so they will then have a pr probation officer who will work with him in the community, and then he'll work with your team. And they all then relate together, because the consultant psychiatrist is like a semi-god there, who decides on the stroke of his pen, where is this man going to go? When he's going to be released into the community? So it's a lot of power. With a lot of power comes a lot of, of course, responsibilities. If anything was to go wrong, the psychiatrist has to go back and explain and defend because the press will pick it up by thinking, you had allowed someone who was so dangerous in the community and could you claim, explain to us what made you to release this person? So there's a very good system. And so forensic psychiatrist then has to deal with all these things. And a um, few things happen over there which are very common things. Procedural security. Procedural security is that if you think you're going to bring this person to a hospital, you really need to have a very good phenomenon to understand what does that mean. It's like a few weeks ago, uh, our hospital, because it's accredited, they've got a team, they came around and looked into our OPD and looked into the different things by saying, yeah, psychiatry ke aate, ko kisi ko maar bhi sakte to yahan pe aake pas and those are the questions that when we design a forensic psychiatric unit, we have to be very careful. And then we look into all those things. What are the procedures? How the patient will come? Where he will come? What will be the situations around it? And there are tools to do that. So procedural security becomes very important. So becomes relational security. And the question is, what does relational security mean? And you could clearly see that over there, they have got these acts that work along with them. That kind of tells you, you have to read these acts and walk around them. So all the units over there, whether it's a prison service, whether it's a, co whether it's a hospital, it's a community, they need to be trained in relational security. What does that mean? It means very simple. If I'm going to be working with my colleague 
who is not aware about the forensic issues, she or he would not find out when is the right time to say to the patient the interview is finished, or the fact that we need to give you some medication, or the fact we think we probably need to help you other ways. And then again, you have to understand that when all these things happen, there could be other people who are not trained, like there could be assistant staff, health officers, who we call them, over here, junior staff. They all need to be aware of, if there's a patient who's admitted, they need to have a certain amount of level, a knowledge. And that relational security counts a lot when you're treating with these patients. So that's another subject that has to be taught to people. So it's kind of like building up to you what forensic psychiatry, how it works around, and that's the risk assessment. It's, it's just like if a patient comes to a cardiology unit, you are probably going to ask him to, to get an ECG done, and then probably going to ask him to do certain other tests and then stunts and everything else. In forensic psychiatry, risk assessment is the key. And what kind of risk assessments we are talking about is that you really need to define this patient who is you going to be seeing, is he going to be risk to others? Is he going to be risk to himself? And what is the risk of violence? <clears throat> now, in the last couple of months in Pakistan, the risk, which is probably highlighted here, the sexual risk has increased tremendously. Zana murder case, somebody who's a rapist, he's a rapist and he's a murderer too. And I don't just my personal view is that we haven't dealt with that issue as much as any other country would have dealt with. Because what you have done is you have just arrested someone, he's still in the court proceedings, then you're going to just throw him into the jail where he'll be there for life imprisonment. If he's going to be life imprisoned forever, it'll be 35 years. If it's just one life, 17 years. It will be day and night, seven years, gets a probation, he could be out in five years. <coughs> In the outside world, people think that after five years, the man who has been up to the whole country of Pakistan can live in your head with you. And there is no law to stop him. And similarly, you send your kids to the school here, and they could be standing outside the school, you send your kids to the school here, and they could be standing outside the school, your kids and kids and kids and kids and kids. So they are actually asking, those risks have to be evaluated, and you have to find out what is the pathology that makes these people to do that. If they do this, then you should have a team that should be treated. And that's where the forensic psychiatrist needs to come into play. So, in my view, I had actually requested that I really wanted to interview this man so we can actually make at least a case study to explain what was he thinking. In forensic psychiatry, a rapist is one pathology, which could be understandable. They are sexual psychopaths. But when they become rapists and murderers, the pathology is completely different. In this case, there were seven murders or 11 murders. I don't want to talk about Zainab murder case, but <clears throat> just because it's of interest to all of us. And as a forensic psychiatrist, we have to ask, what were his sexual fantasies? What was he thinking before and after? Did he have sex before and after? Was he just excited because he was strangulating? Why did he dump the body? You know, all these things have to be looked into. And that tells you whether this was just one man and what was his problems. Was he a learning disabled person? What history did he have in the past? All these things have to be seen and then you have to treat him. And then you have to decide. And that's what you need to present. And then there are about 16 other cases happening in every other province. Police tries to arrest them, catch them, khatam ho These are the different issues, but that's not the only issue in Pakistan. <clears throat> well, they're different. I mean, the, the, the remaining risk factors are we have got different structured assessments that we do to do risk assessments, so I probably will skip them. HCR 20. Now, HCR 20 is a world's reading risk assessment. It's like this, like you have to say that you have to do something in medicine and you won't do CPC. You won't do it completely. And you say that I think that your hemoglobin will be higher than that. That's so crucial. Forensic psychiatry does not work if you have not done risk assessment and the tools have to be the ones which are applied everywhere in the world. It's a beautiful tool. So it is called HCR means Historical Clinical Risk Assessment. There are three components. And it's such a validity tool that when all the people are trained, psychologists, psychiatrists, all get trained. Every patient that we see, we have to get the scores of this, which tells us what happened before, what can we do, and 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 what can we do. And just to kind of help it around, I have just quoted this study. It's a very simple study. It's a very nice one. I just picked it up. And you can completely see what they did actually in this was very simple. I mean, Swedish study, seven clinicians undertook the task of 43 violent offenders, and they were all admitted to a forensic hospital. 
Now these assessments were done independently of each other. No discussion of the cases between the assessors. Outcome, high internal consistency and high interiority. The whole process implemented this research instrument was very good. And that's kind of a taken as an issue by saying you really need to see how good this tool is. And just to see whether this tool was good or not, when I was working in Norwich, and I presented that in Amy, I think it was probably 2013. What I did, I just came up with another idea. I just thought this tool is used by psychologists, psychiatrists, occupational therapists, and we had this medium secure unit, patients who had all personality disorder. Personality disorder ke patients ka IQ na acha bhi ho sakta. They are not psychopaths, so they can have IQ between more than 100 and 113. Choose a very creative psychopath, they can have an IQ of something 134, 160, very dangerous people. But this idea was that rather than I work with them, I developed a tool which I asked the patients to work with me, to try to understand. We just kind of minimized them. Well, just included a limb to that. Those people who have risk them, we taught them a little bit. And then we said that with tools, you have to do behavior. They were very violent people. And we just did it after about six months. We saw the jo violence ki rating thi, wo kam aage. Just probably we just tooled this jo, jo yehi tool tha, usko other way around use kiya. Just to kind of show you how these kind of a risk management circles work around. And those kind of things we were doing, we were all doing that abroad. The question is, ki forensic pathway hai kya? So you can see actually forensic pathway actually involves simply, there's a prison, and from prison you can have a high secure, then medium secure, low secure, PQs psychiatric intensive care units, then you can actually say you can go from medium scale to low scale, then independent apartments, then you can actually go from low scale, you can go in an open rehab back into the community. That kind of a circle has to be completed. So as I get a good patient, that's what the government is looking for to bring you back here. So in the last three years, there's a revolution in UK. They just want no one patients to be here and here. They are spending a lot of money by saying, patients, we really want them back into the community. The whole service change will be. That means there was a huge demand on us to produce treatment outcome results. Joke forensic psychiatry ka kisi bhi psychiatry mein bodh mushkil. But that's what they're pushing us to do. That's a huge task and we're just waiting to see what happens. But most of the services are not designed to send them back into the community. <clears throat> so the question is, itana kuch jo bola ja raha matlab kya hai? What are these health, what we're saying, forensic hospitals, secure hospitals, what does it mean? Basically, there are three. There's a high secure, and that's a really high secure means to wo patients in the community. The case of Peter Sutcliffe, who is like uh, what we call as um, mm, sort of a, he was given the mini name of uh, York Ripper because he had assassinated something like 32 slash prostitutes and then he had sex with them and then he used to chop their head. And then they finally arrested him. Peter Sutcliffe is now in Broadmoor and we have to work with him. So one of my consultants were working with her and that's a little teeny story about it. Now he's in there for 14 years. For the first six years he was completely isolated. So it's a, I'll show you, I haven't got his picture deliberately, but I'll show you what the hospital looked like. Um, um, high scale hospitals look like. So, um, and, and I'll, I'll start, I'll show it to you. I mean, this is a low secure hospital. As the hospital I've worked with, this is Ashley in Bradford in Birmingham. So, you know, the concept is not like it's a beautiful purpose built hospital. You could see that actually in here, there are no walls. It's just like the reception, you go in there, and then there are all patients in there, different blocks. And we work with them, and then this is the only room they can't come out unless we have given them the assassinations. Or is me mental health act has to be applied. They all are going to be detained. And these settings can be designed for autistic patients and learning disabilities too. If you kind of move on to the next scale, this is uh, a medium scale center. This is John Harvey. This is in London. We work there too. Now the difference around here is simply these walls. You can see the fences go on. So there's one fence and there's another fence in there. And these fences are something like 25 meters long, and they're going to be all fenced around. All the treatment will be happening inside. This is the reception. That's only you, me, and all these people go in there, and then they get trained. And they're like five-star treatments, but all the treatment will happen in there. So the question is, ye wo log hai, low scare se zyada security mangte. So they go into the medium scare hospitals. And then comes the top, which is called the high secure. And you can see this is the three hospitals high secure there. 
There are Ashford, Broadmoor, and um, Brampton. This is Ashford. Look at that. This is all scaled, fenced. From here, before you go in, there's a high security, just like you go in movies. You really need to have a complete badge, identification. You can't take anything in there. And you really know who you're going to go and see, and there are going to be all the departments in there. And that's kind of the hospital where Peter Sutcliffe was. And for 16 years, first six years, he was completely isolated. No one with him. And this consultant friend of mine, Celia Taylor, she was working in them, and she came back to us and said she resigned from there, and said, what happened? She said, she said, she said, I think he should be allowed to at least interact with one more patient. So she just thought, Kush to treat come out, come on, she had a lot of assessments and allowed him to work with that. Middle of the night, she gets the call by saying, Peter Sutcliffe had plunged a pencil into the person who was having dying food. So poor red number. And then, of course, it's a high square. So he had to probably was jetted out from there into King's Cross and a huge problem, securities. So those patients are very dangerous. We would work with them from different treatment therapies and we tried to help them to understand why were they doing this and how we can help them and how the risk is changing. You have to understand they're very complicated cases, but they will keep them in there because the community is not safe. So, this is a setup which of course you can understand that Pakistan can be far away from that because you really need to have the services when forensic sets up. So it's a little map just to explain to you what happens. Let's suppose someone is in the community here. Say, for example, we go to Centaurus. There's a person there who is actually behaving very violently. You know, he becomes very aggressive, pulls a knife out and tries to stab someone. You call the police and you arrest him. And then, of course, but during this, he obviously cuts himself and you bring him in, disturb criminal behavior, you bring him to the emergency room. He gets treated, he's fine. He can go out, job is done. But if he gets arrested because the violence is too wrong, the police will actually take him to the crisis team. That crisis team has to decide whether we call us or they have their diversion scheme and they send him back into the community. If they decide, no, this is not going to happen, this man has to go to the court, they keep him overnight for two days, then the police, what we call the police surgeon comes there, assesses him, calls us, whoever is on duty in that area. They go and they assess this guy and they ask him, keep him there or we just send him to a jail and we have to produce him in front of the judge. Now we have to in 48 hours produce a report. The report has to decide kiss mental health at ke tayad humne iska treatment karna hai. And the judge is waiting for you to do that. If you produce this report and the you say this man has to go into the forensic mental health system, the judge will ask you a simple question. Community? Low secure, high secure, medium secure. Where is it going to go? And you tell the judge and the judge gives an order under Mental Health Act, person goes there and all the system starts that I explained to you. If the judge decides, no, I don't think so, aapki sanity and sanity plea clearly mujhe karti, mera khayal hai ke he needs to go back into the prison, into the parole, back into the criminal justice system because mental disorder defined new up. Judge can say, I'm not convinced this man has got that insanity plea that you're saying. They have done so many times. Now the cases that happen out there, Western world made threatening are here and here. Because what had happened is that schizophrenics, like the Zito case, Jonathan Zito case, is kipa pura trust ban gaya, pura pura papers ban gaya. We had actually sent, the judge had sent him back here. Or they had actually sent him from here back into the community without a full follow-up. So schizophrenic was a voice that came from the hospital. 3-4 years of treatment in the hospital. He was at the tube station. He was still hearing voices because he was missing his medication. So Jonathan Zito is the guy who asked all the names. He just went there and stabbed him 17 times in front of everybody in the tube station. People arrested him. Of course, a huge cry happened. He was schizophrenic. So all the media said, schizophrenic, what was the community? What happened to all these things? So when they looked into his track record, they thought, how many times he was in a psychiatric hospital? How many times judges have seen him? How many times doctors have treated him? Then how did he get out of it? And things still happen. And then of course we have to explain, they have to have very careful measures when you ask the people to come out. So these are the responsibilities that happen in the system. As I was trying to say, we have to give a reference to the UK because that's where the Mental Health Act is. As a way, the Pakistan Mental Health Act, we have almost copied from the Mental Health Act and we have made our own, what we have started as an ordinance, now we have a Pakistan Mental Health Act, but it's provincial. It's in Sindh, in Punjab and KPK. More or less the same thing. What is the act? This is what the act asks you to do. Can you section patient? When can he be sectioned? What does different sectioning mean? 
and thus patient has to be sanctioned to get admitted to the treatment. Now, the section of the book is Mental Health Act. All the psychiatrists are supposed to know them by heart. All the junior doctors too. Everyone needs to know that. As a patient in emergency, and it was violent. If a patient came to you, it was suicidal. And you understand that this is a human being. The depression rate is too high. So you said, brother, it's good for you that you're going to get treated. But he decides, I'm not going to get treated. I'm not going to get treated. Now what will you do? There's nothing you can do. You can just explain to the family, what we do in Pakistan. But it doesn't work over there. Over there we have to immediately think about, you can't read that, but these are sections, civil sections. There's a call as section 2, section 2, 5, 4, section 4. You have the authority given to you by the court. You think that you don't know the man, we just put a pink paper, write it on section 2. Now all the police services and all the ambulance services are at your disposal. If you're saying he's not going to go, he will not go. So you treat him for, for 72 hours, 48 hours. But the law is very good. If you detain him for 28 days, there's a mental health act, what we call the commission. Just like our sort of HEC, CQC, we need to create that. Punjab is a health service commission. But their duties are completely different. They see that there is no one else. There is a quality care commission in the outside. And that's got the responsibility to make it sure that no one has a right to go. So if you put him on a section, the health commission will come back and ask you in 28 days and they'll hold a tribunal. The tribunal will be held in the hospital. And they will come with a psychiatrist, with a lay person and with a person from mental health commission and they will ask you, please tell us, you have detained them, tell us why you have detained them, what are the rights? Then he comes with a solicitor and you have to have all the evidence medical to produce to the, what the tribunal, why he detained it. Answers were simple, because it was depression, it was psychosis. But that's how they built it up into it. So we have emergency, we have to treat it for three days, we have to treat it for three days, and then you change the act. And that's what the sectioning means. Only way you can section is A, you know the sections, act, B, the act are applicable, C, the facilities are there, and four, everybody knows what the act means. And that's what is important, what we need in our country too. So, which probably are in our earlier stages. As I said, so, are we to early days, at least we are all sitting talking about it. Maybe in a year's time, there'll be more people listening to it. Just a reflection of mental health in Pakistan. Pakistan ke act mein aise koi lafs hain, to dekha gaya to bilkul hain. There is a word called mentally disordered prisoner. Now, this is the tragedy now. Look at that. Person who is a prisoner in whose detention or removal to a psychiatric facility or another place of charity order has been made. Order has been made. Kis jaga? Kaun si facility? There is no such facility in Pakistan. Look at the acts. Ek, I've got my colleague, criminal lawyer, sitting with me. Look at those acts they're putting into. Sirf usko le jane ke liye. They just need one mental health act, section 2. That's it. To pehli to jaga hi nahi banai, phir aapne act bhi bana diya. So if I want to apply it today, where will I send it? Where will I take it? Where will I apply it? If I think so. So you know, these are the lacunas which we probably think we really need to work on. One is the reflection of our act. The other is that when you read the act, you will find that it's not that they have not mentioned the forensic security. Because obviously we have copy-pasted the mental act from UK, which we normally do, it's fine. Forensic psychiatric services. Now look at that. Special security forensic psychiatry developed by the government to house mentally disordered prisoners, mentally disordered prisoners as may be prescribed. It's so much to understand. If there is no facility, if there is no facility, then it's coming to understand. Administration or transfer or concern with the criminal proceeding in such facilities be under the administrative control or inspector general of prisons. In the whole world, the inspector general of prisons is not the job. He doesn't have any training. He doesn't have any training. It's a mental disorder health issue. Actually, here it should be, of course, over there is psychiatrist and Ministry of Home Affairs, which qualifies you, gives you the power to design, and the tribunals. And then Board of Visitors shall have an access to such persons admitted in forensic facility. Board of Visitors. Then when I looked into the Board of Visitors, was said that a Bureau of Federal Secretary is a medical superintendent. I mean, that's a joke. So if I present this, actually, in an international conference, they probably think maybe I'm somewhere living in a in which part of the world. Those needs to be changed. What is the reason for that? It is that when they made the act, the act was in the outside, the act was in the outside, the act was in the outside, the board of visitors was not there, and I thought, the board of visitors are those who will decide. Do you have to stay in the inside or not? The board of visitors, here, every six months, people change. There is no training, no teaching. 
it doesn't look nice. It doesn't look because we are here, we're going to be presenting our country to other countries too. So those are the things I want you to know. And, sh and sure, one day we probably will look into that. So it, it does appear to be that our picture is a little bit. So I'm now from forensic security, what happens in abroad, I'm going to bring you back to our country. So this article is in Java, it's a very nice journal, and you can't read it because the print is not very good. Basically, in this article, the article that is written in it, it is said that Pakistan is very important to mental health in Pakistan, because there are many cases where there are cases of blasphemy. There are no cases here. If there is a blasphemy case, then the judge said that, okay, it should be a death penalty. I'm not going to go into the controversy of that. But the controversy that I appeal to me is a reason. So after that, they said that if it's a mental health act, then maybe we can see that in blasphemy cases, when he said that his mind was wrong or not. So that kind of an article was written down, and then, although it's not a very good one, but I just wanted to show that people have written in Pakistan, that they should do something. Now comes the question where it becomes interesting. So I just thought, that when we talk about the blasphemy cases, there's another hobby of mine, I write articles. So I just thought that media may be another thing, people pick it up. So I started writing columns, which I've been writing for, I don't know, since 1995. Five, six years now. And I selected subjects like terrorism, mental health act, social problems, domestic abuse, violence. But this area was a huge interest to me. So I just thought Pakistan that was the first case. Non-responsibility in schizophrenia. So judge ne decide kya, hamari judge, one decide kya, schizophrenia ki definition kya. Up schizophrenia ki simple definition is a admi. جس کی کانٹیک نہیں ہے ریالیٹی سے کیونکہ اس کو سائیکوسز ہے ہلوسینیشنز ہوتی ہیں ایولیشنز ہوتی ہیں اس کی تو سینیٹی ہے ہی نہیں تو اس کو تو سزائے موت آپ نہیں دے سکتے کیونکہ پہلے تو آپ اس کی منٹل انلسٹی کی نہیں تو جج نے کہا سکیٹسوفرینیا کیا ہوگا منٹل ڈسورٹر کیا ہوگا دیفنیشن انہیں کلیا اور اس کا ہے ہمیں آپ سے آسکتے ہیں کہ یہ تو بہت ظلم ہے ہمارے ساتھ ایسا تو بہت ظلم ہے ہمارے ساتھ Pleading insanity, this is a case that I picked it up and I got involved with this case too. یہ ایک ایسا آدمی تو سکوٹلنڈ میں ایڈن برہ میں رہتا تھا. بیٹی بھی وہیں رہتی. سکسٹی ایئرز کا آدمی تھا. اس کے سفرینی تھا. وہاں پہ سیکیٹرک ہاسپلٹس پہ علاج بھی کراتا تھا. نون تھا. ریپورٹس نہیں. اس کا یہاں سکس روڈ کے پاس ایک گھر تھا. تو وہ گھر واپس رہنے آیا تو پڑوسی نے کہا یہاں تو کوئی آتا ہی نہیں یہ بابا کہاں سے آگیا. اس نے جا کے ایف آئی ایر کٹائی کہ اس نے بلاسمی کی ہے حضور صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم کے گینسٹ ہوچکا ہے اس کو انہوں نے اریسٹ کر لیا اریسٹ کر کے جیل ملے ان کے سزائے موت ہے اب اف کورس چونکہ اس کے پاس ڈبل نیوشنالیٹی تھی تو گورنمنٹ وہاں کے انوالڈ ہو گئی سکوٹش ایم پی فرسٹ منسٹر گوٹ انوالڈ تین ڈیویڈ کیمران واز دیر ہی گوٹ انوالڈ ایف سیو گوٹ انوالڈ ویس فارن کومن ویلتھ آفیس رائل کالی سیکیٹریس گوٹ انوالڈ نا وی گیٹ انوالڈ سو کیونکہ انہوں نے مجھ سے وہاں سے ڈھونڈ کے کہا کوئی ایسا سیکیٹریس ہے جو رائل کالیج کا بھی ممبر اور پاکستان کا بھی ہو پلیز سمجھائیے کہ یہ ہوگا کیا اس کا there's a big NGO that got involved basically it was a case of this man pleading insanity because he's got a long history of schizophrenia اب امیجن کریں کہ جج نے کیا کہا اس نے کہا میں سیکیٹری ریپورٹ جو پہلے کی سکوٹلینڈ کی وہ میں انٹرٹین نہیں کر سکتا مجھے کیا پتا ہے یہاں سے آگے کون ہے تمہارے پاس کوئی فرنسک سیکیٹری میرے مطلب that's the height انہوں نے گوروں کو بھی پتا ہے and then of course you know Shabazz Shri Sahib involved karna pada, government ko involved karna pada. But the sad case is this man got actually killed by one of the another inmates in the prison. And that's a different story. So, not that's a very success story. You know, I wrote down an article on the gruesome Pakistan first cannabis killer. So bache is aadmi ne khai. Aur ye bhi nahi ke jhoot tha. Unho ne bones dekhi sab kuch kiya. Ek badi si khabar lagi, uske baad khatam ho gaya. Now this was the man we needed to study. Because even if it was Hannibal the cannibal, جو بھی تھا کوئی تو تھا کیوں کرتا تھا کیسے کرتا تھا خالی پارتا تھا کرتا تھا سیکشل کرتا تھا بیچتا تھا there was a plot all just because the picture hit so you can't say the cases are not happening this is the article I wrote because this is the turning murder of Maria Sadaqat into suicide یہ مری کی بچی تھی سکول ٹیچر تھی انہوں نے پیمز کے اندر آکے برن کا کیس ہوا ان کی امی نے کہا ہماری بیٹی کو سویسائیڈ کیا گیا کہ بیٹی کو ہماری مارا گیا ہے نو دے کیس بیکن ہے آسمان جہانگیر کو اللہ جنت نصیب کرے شی پوٹ اکمیشن انہوں نے پر کمیشن بنایا اور کہا میں پرو کر کے بتاؤں گی کہ اس بچی کو سویسائن نہیں ہوئی اس بچی کو انہوں نے مارا ہے I got interested in it because for the same reason so I approached the people over here who are working with it it's a very good friend of mine he's an investigative journalist he writes for news and comes on TV and everything. I asked him, I'm interested in this case. He did my work with me, with geopolicing, and the police sent me all the FIA papers, and I read the court readings. One thing I got hold of, 
एज अ क्रिमिनोलॉजिस्ट लिटल इंटरेस्ट इन टेट उन्होंने हमें सी डी आरस भेजी सी डी आरस कॉल कंप्यूटराइज डिजिटल रिकॉर्डिंग्स ये लोग आप करते हैं व्हाट्सएप के ऊपर टेक्स्ट मैसेज वी कैन ट्रैक्स एवरी थिंग आउट एवरी थिंग आउट वॉज देयर इन अ ट्रांसक्रिप्ट उस बच्ची ने मरने से पहले बहुत लंबे टेक्स्ट किए थे आई एम एन लव विज यू आई एम किल माई सेल्फ आई एम शी एक्चुअली टोल्ड हिम एट सॉ आई एम गन किल माई सेल्फ सो इट वॉज अ केस वज सुइसाइड सो आई रोड बैक टू आसमा सर मैंने आपकी रिपोर्ट पढ़ सकता हूँ विच यू सेन इट टू मी आई रिव्यूड इट स्क्रूटनाइज एंड रोटर बैक बस एंग मैम बुरा ना मनाइएगा यू जस्ट टुक द मीडिया बिकॉज यू वॉन्ट टू टेक द हाइप यू नो वट शी रोड बैक टू मी एंड सर वन सेंट है शी पस्ट बी लिसनिंग टू मी शी रोड बैक टू मी एंड सर एवरीबॉडी इज इन टाइटल टू दर ओपिनियन बस सर यू आई रिस्पेक्ट यू बट हाउ दिस इज केस इज गेट रॉन्ग दिस इज अ केस ऑफ सर सैन एंड यू रिली नीड टू नो वन दोज केस इज हैपन टू इन्वेस्टिगेट दैम and again the forensics gets involved kyunki kyun karte hain log kyun marte hain reasons kya hain court kya hai law kya hai acts kya hain ye sab cheezon ki zarurat hai and then of course i couldn't resist myself writing on this is a prison sex pipeline in peshawar ye bade qaidi aur chote qaidi ek hi jail mein to bade qaidi chote qaidiyon ko use karte hain sex ke liye jitna tum sex karoge utna tumhara chance hai tum bahar chale jaoge police bhi beech mein bol rahe hain one boy got escaped he got escaped he went to pata nahi kaise journalist usne interview de diya that's the boy picked up and he confessed on hot that this is what is happening by the way iski story achhi hai because i wrote it down and number of other journalists wrote it down and then kpk has made the act as well the national parliament has made that ke bachon ki prison aur badon ki alag hona chahiye could you just imagine पर हमें दुनिया जहान के मुश्किल साइकोपैथ्स इन वन प्रिजन और एक बच्चे जो नौ दस ग्यारह बारह साल के वो भी इस प्रिजन में वॉट मेच्योरिटी यू कैन गेव आई मीन वॉट आर दे कैन बिकम और इमेजिन करें कि उसके बाद दस पाँच पंद्रह सालों में यही आपके इर्द गिर्द होंगे घर भी काम कर रहे होंगे आपके यू वॉन्ट हैव अ क्लू एंड ऑफ द थिंग्स सो ऐसा नहीं है कि पाकिस्तान में इशूज़ नहीं थे देर आर इशूज़ इन पाकिस्तान एंड वी वॉन्ट टू हाई लेट दैम and that's when i thought i wrote it down a forensic psychiatrist in pakistan this is the column i wrote it down by saying there's a need for us to do that sanity insanity a prisons are not only for retribution we really need to do something about it so this was again one of my kind of a little ways of trying to make my niche into by saying someone has to talk about this i'm grateful to modat rana he's an editor for jbss and he actually wrote it down again an editor and saying hamara bada khayal hai ki pakistani psychiatrist me and my very good friend of mine she sobia she works in uh, st andrews university of birmingham and she said these people are working they want to come back to pakistan we must do something and you know we wanted to do something and so we actually did something we actually pakistan ke andar we hold a big conference in april 2016 sent for 4 days that's just a slide from there four days conference we introduce a subject the justice sahab bhi aaye jo ab chief justice hain unhone bhi sab kuch kiya and we thought university of health sciences would start an msc program on forensic health sciences it's still in infancy but those are the things we're trying to do so i'm not trying to beat my own drum but i'm just trying to tell you ke forensic secretary ko launch karna kitna zaruri hai so i'm cautious of the time and what is the journey so far the journey so far is ke jab main is dafa wapas aaya and thanks to my friend in lundbeck we decided the two things we can do उन्होंने मुझसे कहा आप हमारे साथ बीजिंग चलें बहुत अच्छी कॉन्फ्रेंस है हमारे लिए पड़ी है सच बोलें बीजिंग जाने से कहीं बेहतर है कि यू मेक मी द फेस फॉर नॉन बैक एंड आई इंट्रोड्यूस फ्रेंसिक सकाइट्री एंड देव बिन वेरी काइंड सो आई हैव बिन गोइंग टू द सेवन डिफरेंट इंस्टीट्यूट सो फार आई वेंट टू मेो एंड द ब्यूटिफुल डिपार्टमेंट सकाइट्री वेंट टू द एशियन इंस्टीट्यूट इन लाहौर आई वेंट टू के आर एल ट्वाइस सी डी ए पिम्स एंड वी आर हेयर नाउ एंड वी आर टॉकिंग अबाउट इंट्रोड्यूसिंग द सब्जेक्ट ऑफ फ्रेंसिक सकाइट्री first to the psychiatrist then to the royal college college of physicians and surgeons then to the different universities while we are all doing this at least the idea is emerging up there is a need for this speciality to grow and the people need to learn while we were doing that i also came up this idea is called fish which we're going to start here and very privileged with my colleagues see me especially tani and nisan and rizwan फिश इज द आइडिया दैट आई जस्ट थॉट के पाकिस्तान में ना अभी क्लिनिक्स नहीं बन सकते हैं जज नहीं राजी होगा प्रिजेंस नहीं होंगे बट एटलीस्ट वॉट आई कैन डू इज टू मेक एन इंस्टीट्यूट विच इज अ लर्निंग वन सो वॉट वी आर प्लानिंग टू डू नाउ इज टू होल्ड एटलीस्ट क्वार्टरली लेक्चर्स ऑन ऑल दिस थिंग्स दैट हैव छोन यू रिस्क असेसमेंट मेंटल हेल्थ एक्ट इंटरेस्टिंग केसेस तो एटलीस्ट पीपल शुड बिगेन टू गेट अ लर्निंग प्रोसीजर टू दैट even if it takes us a year this institute without intervention would be at least able to say pakistan ke andar koi ye to nahi log kahenge log sochte bhi nahi the forensic ke bare to koi baat nahi abhi hum unit nahi bana sakte maybe the judges will want to decide or the prison court will decide and this simulation will happen 
अब जब ये सब कुछ हो रहा था तो दिस हैपन somebody from this uh, kabul mental health hospital it's a 300 bedded hospital there are two forensic hospitals in kabul one is in kabul one is in herat and they have got like a 60 bed unit unhone mujhe approach kiya aur kaha please hamare psychiatrist ko train kar dijiye so we're going to design a course for 3 weeks and they're coming here next month to learn from us so what we're going to teach them mostly tutorials and learnings and everything plus we'll take them to the visits to the prison and something which is kind of a basic level course and while all this is happening there are two other things have happened as we introduced i mean other agencies which are working on these issues issues agencies like police agencies like isi agencies like uh, nacta they have been in touch with us i mean i'm very courteous to my friend homera she is we have been working together for last 11 years now or more than that so nacta is the national anti counter terrorism authority it's been working since 2007 and been implemented to 2012 that is supposed to work against counter violence and extremism that's all to do with forensic psychiatry how you deal with these people what is the pathology how are you going to find out they are not going to do it again where are you going to train them how are you going to look into the other services so my plans obviously are that from fish at least even if i can't do the intervention we probably would like to do at least the learning processes to go into it and that would probably at least be a good start for us so I know I've kind of a bored you enough but I'll kind of leave you with this final uh, if I can make this is just a comic I think just just for the light heartedness and if you can read it I can read it for you it says when I spend money I'm happy when I'm out of money I'm sad so I'm be you bipolar I'm a bipolar so thank you very much for listening to me Well, I mean, it's very encouraging to hear. I think um, that's probably one thing we're going to do is through this Fish Institute, we will be helping you to at least learn the basic necessary instruments, things for what a forensic psychiatrist or forensic psychiatry team uses. If you are a trained clinical psychologist and you already have got your psychology degree, were you to have at least six or eight of those lectures with us, and if there was going to be an institute like a forensic psychiatry they you will be the pioneers to work with them that's one area the other area which is emerging up very quickly is these agencies like the works of nacta cve and government is very keenly interested in working on in those areas which are mental disordered offenders not terrorists have not been defined as mentally disordered but because it is falling into this area where violence is happening they need to have people who have understanding of forensics and there is no unit in this world that i know of which will work without a psychologist so i just in the early stages here or my daughter is finishing her clinical directorate in forensic psychology it's a four years program it on asks them to go after she has done her masters and bachelors um she is supposed to go and work with psychiatric hospitals prisons and then they train you to go through all this but most of the things that and then she becomes say for example a doctorate in clinical psychology but does not mean that we can't provide you we can help you to at least be having that much amount of knowledge for we to then ask you to please could you work with these agencies or these units or for the matter of fact wherever you want to you will be a clinical psychologist with a lot of information on forensics so it's a good start that's about the problems uh actually when i can understand why some of you wanted to forget it from the point of view model you can hire us if we zara young women die in pakistan the dark of the crime is huge in fact the rpc ka bhi amendment aa gaya hai any young woman's death especially uh, actually go uh, if she comes to the hospital in a burnt condition will be considered a murder it will be investigated along those lines so what because of the huge number of young women who die at the hands of the families is it go in anger as a matter of policy 
question i think of course it is sounded like it's the forensic psychiatrist who is holding the key to the whole forensic psychiatry but actually it's the marriage between psychiatrist and psychologist there's no unit that i have worked in the last 6 10 years which heavily relies on psychologist as a matter of fact over there in uk they are even considering that the forensic psychologist should take the lead and they should become a lead clinician over there we are calling them as approved clinicians which only used to be doctors but now psychologists can be because the clinical psychologist is the one who actually sits in the team and she is the one who is going to help us with a couple of things to start with a patient comes with a history of violence and we know that he has got a long history number of forensic issues have happened the question first is who is going to assess him what is his risk now what is his iq and what are the risks towards violence sex and everything now the psychologist tells us i'm going to use hcr i'm going to use svr i'm going to use and there are different other names that i just want to mention then the psychologist with her team chooses this tool and assesses she is the one or he is the one who tells us that's what the risk is then we sit with her and the whole management plan is designed where she has a huge say now she does not come to us in the tribunal when the judge comes to the court judge actually brings the court back to the hospital with those such cases but we heavily rely on the clinical psychologist report if the judge thinks that doctors have aapki psychiatry bilkul theek hai but the report of the clinical psychologist is so important to me he invites her or him and she sits with us so clinical psychologists like a co-pilot tools because they are trained in doing all those trainings as we my friend was asking so clinical psychologist gets forensic psychology training and all those tools and there are different tools because the question around here is tool is not only about the hcrs we are also interested in stat which is the another tool that we used which tells us about the assessment of the risk that he present to the treatment then treatment key options can then there are hornoses and then there are iqs and there are risks and mood disorders everything revolves around those tools which the psychologist is a key to us hamare liye wo ye kehte hain ki psychiatrist beshak ye karta nahi hai lekin wo trained ho tamam tools ke और वो उसके साथ बैठ के करेगी वही साइकोलॉजी साइकोलॉजी तो यू कैन जस्ट इमेजिन कि द साइकोलॉजिस्ट इज लाइक द दी मेन रोल प्लेयर इन फ्रेंसिक सर आई होप आई वांट्स द क्वेश्चन सर यू वांटेड टू आस्क सो जस्ट वन क्वेश्चन के और दो साउंड्स लाइक फ्रेंसिक साइकोलॉजिस्ट टर्शी टर्शी लेवल प्रोवेंशन एंड ऑब्वियसली दीस द बिहेवियर्स एंड द पर्सनालिटीज हैव बीन वेरी वेल डेवलप्ड एट और नाइन और टेन इयर्स एंड दे आर द वंस who may be going towards deviant behavior and and criminogenic uh, behavior so how what's the role of child and adolescent psychiatry in trying to identify potential offenders early in society and do that intervention there because this is after things have been done and you are intervening how does that link to yes. the earlier years and sure. what does one do in society mm. to bring that to the fore early on again a very nice question because it asks the question what all these pathologies that we see every time a psychologist or psychiatrist would go through will always say what happened in the childhood and adolescence to uh, there are two ways to that ek to ye hai ki child and adolescence we call as cams child and adolescence mental health services they exist so we have child and adolescent psychiatrists then we have got the cams unit which are all linked within the make major system and what happens there is that they have got juvenile offender prisons wahan pe ek ek hi hai ki law law says 13 years ke peeche agar hoga to saza nahi hone wali to 16 saal ke baad they are saying this is the stage when he is consenting to or they can consent to have sex so age is also define the risks and the violence so ab wahan pe ek bahut mashhoor case hai which is going on for months wo bacche the do unhone ek bacche ko mara and they were just kids there less than 10 years old and their identities was concealed and now they are 42 years old so they've been in the prison for 35 years so shuru me the problem was again that they have got these units which are called cams units so 
When the community picks up those cases where there are violence and there are sex problems, there are drug problems and there are issues to do with violence, they get seen by the CAMS units. CAMS units have got another problem. Personality disorder cannot be diagnosed until you're 18 years old. So what we are doing is that we have got the laws which the Child Protection Acts. So we keep them in the hospital, we can keep them detained, but we have got now the special units, which are called CAMS special units, which deal with the patients who have got issues with violence, because there is a huge problem emerging us now, which you will find that it will happen in our country too in the next few years. Both sare cases which we had diagnosed as having schizotypal personality or personality disorders have all been re-diagnosed as autism. And autism has become a huge thing. So we get trained for that and autistic spectrum disorder means people can present with arson, arson, sexual offenders. And you have units now to deal with that. So what do they do? 10 years, 9 years, 12 years, the judge then decided to say the same thing, but he'll ask them to please send them to the CAMS units. Then the CAMS units have got the same pathology. They have got the low secure units and the medium secure But medium they don't know what They just want to low secure them to treat them and age ka wait age. So low secure units over there, I work with them, but I'm not a child specialist, so we just were overseeing that unit. There are such issues, children and children, self-harm, a lot of substance misuse, violence and aggression, and you have to be very careful how you use the medication. A lot of therapies are done. And then we wait. If the problem is still there, there is a law there that tells us at 17, we have called them as transition services. So adult psychiatrists who are involved at 17, he starts working with them. And if he thinks that this person cannot go into the community, they take him back into the adult services. And then the adult services take it on. Now his history is very strong. First he came to child units, then he came to adult units. Could you see, the, there must be so many reasons. So the services are then designed for them. And sometimes it happens that all people who had problems in their childhood, in childhood and adolescence, but they were not so hard that they didn't deal with the community and the psychiatry and the general psychiatrists. There are also services like PQ. So the children have a lot of substance misuse, violence, and the general psychiatrists deal with them. But they make on history. Because over there, if you, as a forensic psychiatrist, you walk into the prison. I mean, such, I'm sure we will do it. The judge asked me to go and see in the prison, so I will not go and see the person in prison unless I ask three things and they'll provide to me within 17 hours, 24 hours. I asked them to give me the whole history right from his birth, school, GP, occupation, health, prison, everything. It's all ready before I go. And they've got all the documentation, all electronically there. And you have to then assess it out from there. These may, of course, misks hosakte, but they're all linking them together now. So they want that if there was violence in childhood, there was a history, you didn't go. If you saw it later, then the whole record came back. And that's an interesting case of Soham case. This is Ian Huntley. He has a village in Cambridge, Soham. He was a caretaker. So two school children, he actually raped them and then killed them and burned them in incinerators and then buried them. And when the whole thing was like our Zainab case, it was like that. So I was in Cambridge then and I was actually in the psychiatric unit. So they signed us that when Ian Hentley got arrested. So what happened was that the police signed up, the whole squad, and then they make all these community people, they were all on top of it. All the interviews he was giving. And he had a French girlfriend, she was an appware, Caroline. So they all worked with him, they just suddenly had an idea he used to work in Grimsby, which is a southeast, a kind of a rough area. There were three crime cases there, but it was six years ago, and there was an act that after six years, the police had all records off. So when the college had kept the caretaker, the police had asked the record, the record was clear. Now the police thought that they had all the ways, but they had not arrested him. They actually were interviewed, just like they had done the Imran of Zainab. I think according when I spoke to the police guy, he just told me he got a little nervous and anxious. And then he bearded Shaif Skarli and then he went and then they probably actually got hold of him because of his mobile phone. That's what they told me. This case can happen when they interview him for the first time. So you need to have a skill how you interview these people. It's a very short way, probably I've seen. There's a skill to interview these people. When they interview this person, they just got the facts on exactly right. So what they decided, they called him again and they bought his house. Now he didn't know. They got the act to do that. He went back home and he told Caroline, don't make wish to tell because I didn't crack up. That was enough for that. And then Caroline, of course, broke. And then he got arrested. And then he showed us everything that he did. It's a crime. 
And then he got arrested and then they asked us. Then I was in the duty in Cambridge and they said, Ian Huntley, you know, the big case. So I still remember I was going to go with my colleague and he was in Rampton, which is in Northampton. The day I had to go, he had actually attempted suicide. So he had a rope because he became depressed. And then we knew that actually in the prison, there were some people who were pedophiles who were pedophiles who were pedophiles. They had actually asked them to kill him. Then they had to take him to the secure house. He's still alive, by the way. He's depressed and he's mental disorder illness. But, so, I think the point I'm just trying to make is that sexual violence in a lot of detail and assessment. And for this reason, the process is that what they learned from this case? They learned that after this case, no man in the UK, includes us too, जो आदमी बच्चों के साथ काम करेगा, he has to have what they call the enhanced CRB. CRB is their disclosure form, which you have to work. कोई भी काबिल आप UK में आप काम कर लें किसी जगह भी, चाहे पोटर हैं, चाहे डॉक्टर हैं, चाहे इंजीनियर, you have to get the CRB. If CRB is not there, they won't give you the job. इससे पहले CRB नहीं था, और उसके बाद दूसरा पुलिस एक्ट ये बनाया कि पांच साल के बाद पुलिस वाइप आउट नहीं कर सकती, क्योंकि इस केस में ये you know, so probably we are not back there. London, ke andar, London burning case over 2016, ke the whole London was burned. Honest to God, they took two years, employed 2,000 people just to do a research team to figure it out. When London burned, why were people coming out? Why were they burning? Who were the looters? And they took the CCTV cameras, interviewed something like 36,000 people. Now they've got a report, it's available on Google. It's called Reading Rights. It's been like three years now, so many incidents happened, none fled to that because they did their homework now. They knew why people would do it, what they were doing, why did they burn it up? So, you know, we need to do such things, we need to do I'm sorry, I'm speaking too much now. What should we do with our available resources as well as our present intelligence in the society? What should we do? We can't reach that level. What should we do just to start? I think my only answer to this would be collaboration. After that, the people who are doing research, they have to do research. 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 I mean, that kind of a little thing. They can say, you are so good, you are so good, you are so good. Why should I be thinking that I want a lot of things? So if this is an institute, you got another institute in Beria, you got in NUSC, how long does it take? If I think I've got an idea, I think I've got very interesting, shall we meet, shall we talk? Here, private partnership will come, public will come, my personality will come, those people don't do that. While they are working together, they make those forums, they try to work together. Then, of course, they are on our methods different, but they are always thinking, what is good for us? What are we going to take it from here? And they learn, and they learn, and they learn, and they produce that. Learning atmosphere, culture. So, I should learn from this. And then, if we have talked about sex violence today, we have talked about risk violence today, we have talked about forensic security. Now, it's not that we have to go to forensic security. It doesn't matter. But if you have such things that are interested in this area, we just give me a call. We sit together, we probably produce something, we write something, we do, and then we begin to gel together. And there are, my friend around here is leading the whole nuns here. So, the National University of Medical Science is a huge thing. It's going to change, transform the face of Pakistan. And they're all doing it. So, I mean, this is the same thing, 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 working together, collaboration. And then we probably come up with an idea. So, it's not like that, it's never going to happen. Now, Shifa has also done it, as much as we at least made an idea of learning. And I'm sure, you know, one together, that's to my approach would that be. Ma'am, this will be the last question, because I think I'm holding people. Yes, please. Again, a very good question. Forensic psychologist, forensic psychiatrist, nurses. Do to log yahan aur nahi majud. Occupational therapist, social workers. That slide that I showed to you is absolutely no way any medical services can work without nurses. So what you actually have to do is to see nurses who are interested in that. They really need to show. Even if they are bachelors and if they are masters, they need to be given an exposure to go and work with these teams and they begin to learn that. Our here is not a inpatient patient, so our here is a difficult one, but in the rest So the nurses with their basic qualifications, whatever they are doing is perfectly fine. They need to just have an awareness of if they are working in psychiatry and then we train them and they become part of it. 
And again, having said that, over there people are doing PhD in nursing and science. And they are doing PhD in, or masters in writing and there are so many journals. And once again, no unit can be completely. Because I and my psychologist are sitting in the boardroom and we just go to the ward. Everything is nurses. All that relational and spiritual security is actually hinged on nurses. Sir, basically when we visited to the uh, mental hospital Lahore, then we just observed that all the time nurses are interacting with the patients. Not every time the doctor is not interacting. So how we, how we can train uh, that nurses to handle that presence, that present, forensic psychiatric patients, like that, how we can train, is there any platform uh, in the Pakistan uh, for the training or not yet? Mm -hmm. The slide that I showed you is called Hambanare, the Forensic Institute, Shifa Hospital, Fish. We are planning to judge your questions. At least we are going to have a quarterly, half day working training seminar. And I'll pick up all those subjects, which are just the basics, but very crucially related to nurses, psychologists, psychiatrists, doctors. If you attend that, you will figure it out how you work with them. Those are going to be tools. We will teach you, we'll actually lead you with a certificate for showing you've learned that. If you go and apply that, you would find how much it improves the whole services that you provide. Thank you, sir. May I thank you very much again for having me this time. Thank you, sir. Uh, so we come to the end of this session. Uh, you are requested to fill your feedback forms. And when you do that, you may proceed to cafeteria 2 for refreshments. Thank you.